Welcome to the Secrets of the Bible Channel. When presidents make deals with the devil, it's serious. Have you ever thought about who really controls your country? We often think of presidents, prime ministers, and other leaders as the ones who guide and lead our nations. But what if I told you that these individuals might not be the real decision makers? This is not a conspiracy theory, but a spiritual reality that has existed since biblical times. Throughout history, there have been leaders who made decisions that were influenced by evil or demonic forces. For instance, King Herod ordered the killing of children who were born around the time of Jesus. And similarly, Pharaoh took the lives of many children who were born around the time of Moses. King Ahab and his wife Jezebel attempted to lead the nation into worshiping idols. These are a few examples of leaders who were influenced by evil forces. Many leaders in the past have made poor decisions, often because spiritual forces influence their choices. Unfortunately, the same thing is happening today with many of our world's leaders. Their decisions can directly or indirectly impact you, even if you're not aware of it. How can we be certain that this is true? The answer is simple. It's because the policies made by these leaders often align more with the devil's agenda rather than God's. These leaders are carefully handpicked by the devil who influences their decision-making process. We find in the book of Revelation that leaders of great nations will make an evil agreement during the end times. The Old Testament includes 15 books of prophecy, while the New Testament contains only one, Revelation. John, one of the apostles, wrote it when he was in Ephesus. John and Mary, Jesus' mother, moved to Ephesus and spent the rest of their lives there. Revelation was written towards the end of the first century. During that time, the emperor Domitian required everyone to burn incense to Caesar once a year on the Lord's Day. People had to stand before an altar, raise their hands, and declare Caesar as Lord. For the early Christian communities, this was a significant challenge. For their faith was clear. Jesus is Lord. They could not say Caesar is Lord without facing severe consequences. It was now essential to see if the Christians would stay firm in their faith. People have been dying for their faith even before the creation of this book. The book serves as a guide for those who are willing to die for what they believe. Initially, the term martyr simply meant witness. However, it became evident that being a true witness for Jesus might result in the loss of one's life. Therefore, the meaning of martyr changed to refer to someone who dies for their faith in Jesus. John wrote the book of Revelation, but it differs from his gospel in three letters. This is because the book of Revelation was uniquely given to John. God the Father gave it to Jesus, and then Jesus gave it to an angel. The angel then passed it on to John, who wrote it down for all the churches. No other book in the Bible came about in such a complex way. John wrote down what he saw and heard, and sometimes what he saw was so extraordinary that the angel had to remind him 11 times to write it all down. During his visions, John was taken up to heaven, where he heard various voices and choirs singing, and he had to make sure he wrote all of these things down. Revelation is an incredible book with a clear subject. The leaders get drunk with a strange woman in the book of Revelation, the evil entity of Babylon. An angel invites John to witness the judgment of this evil woman. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and spoke with me saying, Come here. I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of sexual immorality, and those who live on the earth became drunk with the wine of her sexual immorality. Right from the start, her judgment is unquestionable. There is never any doubt regarding the fate and ultimate failure of Babylon. Babylon came into being as a religious system a considerable time before Christianity did. But in satanic imitation, it anticipated the coming of the genuine Messiah, according to religious history and legend. The city of Babylon is mentioned in the Bible 287 times and is the second most mentioned city after Jerusalem. The town was once located on the banks of the Euphrates River. It was considered the seat of the civilization that expressed organized hostility to God, according to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, shortly after the flood. Later on, Babylon became the empire's capital and it mercilessly conquered Judah. During that time, Judah was under its control. To the people of God, Babylon represented all evil, 
It was the embodiment of cruelty, lust, and greed, and was considered the enemy of God's people. Those who are familiar with the Old Testament will be aware that the word Babylon is linked to organized forms of worship and blasphemy, as well as the oppression of the people of God. The concept of Babylon has existed long before the events described in Revelation 17 and 18, or the reign of the Antichrist. Babylon represents the world system and has been present throughout history from the time of John when Rome represented it to the present day. However, during the Antichrist's reign, Babylon and both its religious and commercial aspects will exert an unprecedented influence over the world. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls, holding in her hand a gold cup full of abominations, and of the unclean things of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, A mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. In this passage we learn that John is taken into the wilderness, where he has a vision of judgment. The barren nature of the wilderness serves as an appropriate backdrop for this vision. The beast mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 is depicted as having seven heads and ten horns, and is symbolic of the Antichrist and the rule he will establish. It's worth noting that the same strange woman mentioned in this passage is shown riding the same beast mentioned in that verse. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten crowns and on his heads were blasphemous names. The Antichrist The first beast is mentioned in the text as a monstrous creature with ten horns and seven heads. It is granted power and authority by a dragon. One of its heads is fatally wounded but is later healed. This beast speaks blasphemies against God and oppresses the people of God aggressively, wherever they may be found on earth. Furthermore, the beast not only rules the world, but also receives worship from its inhabitants. It is important to note that the first beast is a symbolic representation of the Antichrist, while the dragon represents Satan. I would like to discuss the main manifestation of Satan's kingdom, which is opposition. This opposition is characterized by the spirit of the Antichrist, which is different from the person called the Antichrist and the many Antichrists that have existed throughout history. John's teachings provide a clear explanation of the Spirit and these persons. In 1 John 2 verses 18 through 23 we read, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. For this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. But you are not like that, for the Holy One has given you His Spirit, and all of you know the truth. So I am writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an Antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Allow me to clarify the true meaning of the term Antichrist. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. Therefore, when we use the term Antichrist, we actually mean anti-Messiah. This term has captured the imagination of many people some of whom may not even be familiar with the Bible. However, there are still many who are not fully aware of what the Antichrist truly represents. While Jesus was known for his beauty and charisma, the Antichrist's personality and character will be unappealing and unpleasant. Jesus always spoke the truth, while the Antichrist would only utter falsehoods. In the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 18, the author talks about the concept of the Antichrist and many Antichrists. According to the text, there is a spirit associated with the Antichrist, and this spirit will eventually lead to the emergence of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is believed to be a satanic messiah, 
who will deceive people by appearing as a charming and successful person. He will be the ultimate winner and seem like an angel of light. However, he will lead humanity in a rebellion against God during the end times, which is why it's important to be aware of his true nature. It is believed that there are individuals who are like previews of the Antichrist and his mission, even though the world is yet to see the ultimate revelation of this figure. These individuals are commonly referred to as Antichrists with a small a. In the Bible, the coming world leader is known by various names or titles, including the man of lawlessness and the son of perdition. Throughout history, many individuals have been identified as Antichrists. According to scripture, at the end of this age, a powerful ruler known as the Antichrist will briefly reign over mankind, representing the ultimate manifestation of evil. As we approach the end of this age, the spirit of the Antichrist will become more intense and we will find ourselves battling against it more frequently. The spirit works through every Antichrist, identifying marks of the spirit. John has provided us with significant signs of the spirit of the Antichrist, which are of immense importance. The primary characteristic of the Spirit is that it denies that Jesus is the Messiah. As we can see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, who is a liar, but he that deny that Jesus is the Christ. Furthermore, John explains that anyone who denies the Father and the Son is the Antichrist. It's crucial to realize that the Spirit of the Antichrist does not deny the existence of God. In fact, the Antichrist will claim to represent God. The Spirit denies the Messiah has come. It probably believes in the Messiah will come, but denies that the Messiah has already come, the person known as Antichrist. So we see three names for the same being. The Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and the son of perdition. And we are given one other important name in Revelation chapter 13. This is part of the vision that John had. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. In John's vision, he saw this beast rising from the sea. It is important to note that the beast is distinct from Satan, who is represented by the dragon in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Although the dragon and the beast are related, they are not the same entity. Though this beast is distinct from the dragon of Revelation 12, he is still closely identified with him. He is not the dragon, but he is like him, because the dragon also had seven heads and ten horns, why would Satan give his power to a particular person? The answer is simple. By doing so, that person would gain control over the entire human race and convince everyone to worship Satan, which is his ultimate desire. This is a long-term project that Satan has been working on patiently for many centuries. An image of the beast is set up, and the entire world is commanded to worship it. Throughout history, people have often bowed down to an image of a political leader, the Antichrist is also called the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, as was Judas. John 17 verse 12. Well, I was with them. I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them. And not one of them perished except the son of destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. This world leader is empowered and supported by Satan. Through this man, Satan will express his desire and authority. In this, the beast takes the offer that Jesus refused. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil took him along to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Revelation chapter 13 verse 12 says he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and he makes the earth and those who live on it worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. We read the terms wounded healed. This is indeed an antichrist who even imitates Jesus in his death and resurrection. The world will believe this and it will add tremendously to his fame and power. We then see the authority and popularity of the beast. The power of the beast will astonish the world, leading people to believe he is invincible. Daniel believes that a skilled speaker may not only use sophisticated language, but also speak disrespectfully about God. The Antichrist is depicted as a man whose appearance surpasses that of his peers. His charm, eloquence, and striking appearance will make him highly attractive to many people. The Antichrist will progress from being a regional leader to a world leader, a ruthless global tyrant, and finally a god. 
the beast's blasphemies. Blasphemer may be a more accurate title than Antichrist for this end times dictator. This individual is someone who speaks out against God and opposes everything that God represents, including his name, his dwelling place, and the inhabitants of heaven. Some Roman emperors blasphemed God this way, but they did not fulfill these prophecies, even if they did prefigure their fulfillment. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. According to biblical prophecy, the beast will be allowed to act without restraint for 42 months, which is equivalent to three and a half years. The beast makes war against the saints. The woman riding on top of the beast represents the political power that supports her. This also indicates that she holds a dominant position and outwardly controls and supervises the beast. For God's perspective, her association with blasphemy and the dragon's beast is evident. However, to the people of the world, she may appear to be a devout, faithful person who possesses the faith they desperately need. We then read, the woman was arrayed. The woman is clothed with emblems of governance, scarlet, and emblems of wealth, purple, gold, and precious stones. In spite of this, she engages in idolatry, abominations, as well as impurity, the filthiness of her adultery, in the midst of this luxurious setting. She was dressed in purple and scarlet. The dyes needed to manufacture fabrics in the colors purple and scarlet was difficult to come by and expensive. These colors were associated with splendor and magnificence. On her forehead, a name was written. The name on her forehead it identifies her in more ways than one. We read Mystery Babylon the Great. The term Babylon here does not refer to the actual physical city of Babylon, but rather to its spiritual representation. This spiritual Babylon is considered the source of all forms of spiritual adultery and idolatry. This evil entity is not limited to a single department of a religious organization. It is believed to be the embodiment of Satan's global movement, which could be described as the religion of the global order. Our world is ready to be seduced by the evil entity because it is built on the strong notion that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. We read, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The woman not only persecutes, but she also takes pleasure in the fact that she is persecuting the godly, much like a drunk person takes pleasure in alcohol. Why was this symbol depicted as a female form? A great number of nations have given their homelands the form of a female figure. The angel informs John that all will be made clear to him regarding the strange woman. Revelation chapter 17 verse 7 Why are you so amazed? The angel asked. I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. We read, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. The focus of the exposition is on the beast. It seemed as though this lady governed Rode, the system that the Antichrist had created. But in reality, he is the driving force behind everything and is simply using her in the same way that tyrants have always used religion as a means to achieve their goals. Revelation chapter 17 verse 9. This calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. We read the seven heads are seven mountains. Mountains can symbolically represent nations or governments in the Bible as seen, for example, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns, and the seventh is yet to come. But his reign will be brief. The seventh will very rapidly be usurped by an eighth, and will become the state of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 17, verse 11. The scarlet beast that was but is no longer is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. The beast, also known as the Antichrist, can be identified without a doubt as the eighth king. In the sense that he has qualities with all of the prior world empires, he is one of the seven, but his demise is already predetermined. The word perdition literally translates to destruction, and that is exactly what will happen to the beast Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 through 15, the ten horns of the beast, are ten kings who have not yet risen to power, they will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with. The beast they will all agree to give him their power and authority together. They will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of all lords and King of all kings and his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. 
Then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling represent masses of people of every nation and language 10 kings who have received no kingdom as yet. This probably alludes to a 10 nation confederation, whatever their exact identity, their actions are apparent to you. This particular entity rules over all of the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues in the world. This demonstrates that the evil woman's impact can be felt all across the world as a result of her relationship with the beast. This will be a truly one world religion. The meaning of this evil entity is centered on her connection to the beast, namely how she is completely entwined with the beast and the government that he leads. The evil woman is judged. Antichrist allies turn on this evil entity. Revelation chapter 17 verse 16. The scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. We read, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. In the end, the Antichrist will not tolerate any form of worship other than that of himself. The son of destruction exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped to the point that he sits in the temple of God, demonstrating to himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4 Don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is. God we read burn her with fire after the Antichrist has successfully entrenched his rule. He will no longer require the assistance of religious Babylon. After that, he will make efforts to demolish and ultimately destroy her and her one world religion. Tyrant's primary objective has always been to appropriate religion for their own ends, and then cast it aside afterwards. In the end, everything is guided by the hand of God. Revelation chapter 17, verse 17. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast, and so the words of God will be fulfilled. We read, God has put it into their hearts. The judgment that was sent against religious Babylon was ordered by God. Sometimes God will use one wicked group, in this case the Ten Kings, as an instrument of his judgment against another wicked group, in this case religious Babylon. This happens rather frequently in the Bible. The political support that these ten rulers would provide for the Antichrist will be ordained by God. The world will get exactly what it asks for, which is godless religion and godless government. Revelation chapter 17 verse 18 And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. Rome is said to be the strange woman in this metaphor. We read in the time of John. There was no doubt about which city held the most power over the world's rulers. Rome was the political, economic, and religious center of the world. However, Babylon has always been the great city that reigns over the rulers of the world in a global sense. This has been true since the beginning of time. As Christians, we must ask ourselves whether we are under its reign or if we are citizens of a greater city. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26 But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman and she is our mother. Rome was the ready personification of Babylon. Idolatry is just as prevalent as it was in the past, but it is now more widespread. Which city is most identifiable with the world system? Hollywood? Wall Street? Washington? The fact that the identity of the whore of Babylon is referred to as a mystery indicates that we are unable to know with absolute certainty who she is. The passage does give us some clues. After the strange woman falls, Babylon follows suit. The fall of commercial Babylon. Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 3. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven possessing great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his splendor and radiance. And he shouted with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen, certainly to be destroyed as Babylon, the great she has become a dwelling place for demons, a dungeon haunted by every unclean spirit and a prison for every unclean and loathsome bird, for all the nations have drunk from the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings and political leaders of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth and economic power of her sensuous luxury. Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. He proclaims that Babylon has fallen, 
fallen, and the word is repeated like a solemn dirge on the damned. We read, become a dwelling place of demons. Tragic end for a city that was once of immense importance. The sin of Babylon consisted not only of idolatry, often known as immorality, but also of vanity, greed, and the hoarding of wealth for one's own benefit. Revelation chapter 18 verses 9 through 10. And the kings and political leaders of the earth, who committed immorality and lived luxuriously with her, will weep and beat their chests in mourning over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing a long way off in fear of her torment, saying, Ho! Whoa! The great city, the strong city, Babylon. In a single hour, your judgment has come. We read standing at distance for fear of her torment. These kings have to maintain a safe distance from Babylon because of the intense heat and smoke produced by its burning. Some people believe that this could be a clue to the use of nuclear weapons. As a result, Babylon is now a desolate place without any influence. Revelation chapter 18 verses 22 through 23. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will never again be heard in you and no skilled artisan of any craft will ever again be found in you. And the sound of the millstone grinding grain will never again be heard in you for commerce will no longer flourish and normal life will cease. And never again will the light of a light of a lamp shine in you. And never again will the voice of the bridegroom and bride be heard in you. For your merchants were the great and prominent men of the earth. Because all the nations were deceived and misled by your sorcery, your magic spells and poisonous charm. John uses imagery and poetic language to explain the impending doom that will befall Babylon's manufacturing and commercial sectors. But Babylon is doomed. She and they will fall their days will be numbered. The incredible manner in which this is accomplished is absolutely plausible in today's environment. Ambitious politicians, hungry for power, resent their financial clout. They are even prepared to bring about economic disaster if that will enable them to take over. The kings will be jealous of the woman who rides them and will resolve to destroy her. The city will be engulfed in flames. It will be the world's worst economic disaster in history. Many, many people will weep and mourn over the ruins. The disaster will have been brought about by God, not by any physical action. He will have instilled in their hearts the desire to fulfill his mission. He'll have persuaded them to join forces with the beast to fight the city. The Antichrist will have political authority and the false prophet religious control. The kings will now offer them economic control in return for delegated powers for themselves. But their possession of such privileges will be extremely short one hour. Babylon's demise is so certain that it is depicted in Revelation as having already occurred. This is something Christians can be assured of. However, there are practical reasons for informing them. What is the connection between God's people and this final Babylon? There are three rules to follow. First, there will be many martyrs in the city. The whore is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. This last phrase again indicates the presence of Christians and occurs throughout Revelation. In a city devoted to immorality, pious people have no place. A conscience is something that the community does not desire. Second, Christians are instructed to come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 through 5. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not be a partner in her sins and receive her plagues, for her sins, crimes, transgressions, have piled up as high as heaven. And God has remembered her wickedness and crimes for judgment. Why Babylon matters to us. Babylon's story teaches us that being too proud can get us into trouble and it's important to be humble. It teaches us that however mighty or ambitious we may be, our plans must align with God's will. When they don't, the results can be undesirable. The story of Babylon is that of caution. It warns us against the dangers of pride and self-reliance, urging us to depend on God instead. It also speaks to the folly of human efforts to achieve unity or immortality outside of God's plan. Whether as a community or as individuals, the story reminds us that our ambitions should be aligned with God's will. Otherwise, like the people of Babylon, we risk finding ourselves working against God's purposes, and that can only lead to confusion and ultimately to our downfall.
So the next time you find yourself striving to build the tower, take a moment to consider whether your ambitions align with God's plan for you. Remember, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Psalm chapter 127 verse 1. Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah foretold Babylon's fall due to its injustices, idolatry, and immorality. Therefore, as individuals or as a society, our nations have consequences. Oppressing others, disregarding morality, and turning away from what's right can lead to downfall. We also see that the earthly kingdoms are temporary. Despite its might and grandeur, Babylon eventually fell to the Middle Persian Empire, just as it was foretold. In other words, everything on earth is temporary. From our own successes to the way society is built, the only thing that will last forever is God's kingdom. So, focus on what will last forever, not just on what is here today and gone tomorrow. The story of Babylon getting powerful and then falling apart shows us that God tries to communicate with us in many ways, and we should pay attention and not be too proud. Babylon was an amazing place made by people, but it fell apart because God wanted it to. This story is always important because it reminds us that real power and greatness belongs to God. Like it says in the Bible, God's rule is forever, and it will always be there for all generations. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. This Jerusalem is the one that gives us hope, the Jerusalem that is in the heavens and the location of our true citizenship. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. The city of Jerusalem is defined by two unique characteristics. It is holy and new, unlike any other city on earth. It is both sacred and modern. The city's name itself, Jerusalem, creates a sense of connection to the earth, and specifically to the location of our redemption. It is important to recognize the significance of referring to this divine dwelling place of God and His people as the holy city. Furthermore, it's worth noting that the ultimate fulfillment of Christian hope is deeply rooted in social connections and relationships. The New Jerusalem is distinct from the Old One. It's a place where there is no crying, no sadness, no death, and no pain. In the times to come, it will be revealed that the New Jerusalem does not have a temple, does not make any sacrifices, does not have a sun or moon, and does not experience nighttime sin or abomination. The Hebrew writer says you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. The destiny of the saints of all ages, Hebrews chapter 12 verses 22 through 24. And the angels of heaven is to be welcomed into that church when he takes her into heaven. Towards the end of the passage in Revelation chapter 21 verse 9, an angel invites John by saying, Come. I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Subsequently, John is taken away to witness the holy city of Jerusalem. From this, we can infer that the Bride of Christ and the New Jerusalem symbolize the same entity. This is because the angel promised to reveal the Bride of Christ to John, but instead he showed him the New Jerusalem. How and why should we pray for our leaders? The act of praying for our leaders is not exclusive to democratic nations and has been practiced for a long time even before the United States established its National Day of Prayer. The Bible provides us with various instructions and commands to pray for our leaders, whether they are national or local, secular or religious. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, which it says, First of all, then, I urge that petitions, specific requests, prayers, intercessions, prayer for others, and thanksgivings be offered on behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in positions of high authority, so that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This kind of praying is good and acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who wishes all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge and recognition of the divine truth. Seek peace and well-being for the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its peace, well-being, you will have peace. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 7 in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, it says, For it is through Him that we both have a direct way of approach in one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenship, and you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people. 
and are members of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Prayer is a crucial aspect of our lives, especially when it comes to those in positions of authority. The Bible emphasizes the importance of praying for government officials at all levels, pastors, church elders, school boards, school boards, school principals, employers, and others in positions of leadership. We don't pray for our leaders only because we're commanded to do so. It also makes practical sense to pray for them. The actions of our leaders can have significant effects on our daily lives and can influence our families, churches, workplace, cities, and countries. When those in authority are aligned with God's will, it becomes easier to live a peaceful and holy life. As mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, when wicked men are in power, our prayers for them are just as necessary as exemplified by William Tyndale's final words as he was burned at the stake. Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Also, we do not pray for our leaders merely for our own benefit. Leadership can be a tiring task. James chapter 3 verse 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Leaders carry a degree of responsibility to their followers. They are often the targets of criticism and the go-to people in a crisis. If they are leading well, they are living their lives in service. We pray for them because we recognize the greatness of their task and because we are grateful for their willingness to lead. How should we pray for our leaders? If we are unsure whether our leaders know Jesus, our first prayer should be for their salvation. However, regardless of their faith, we should also pray for God's guidance in their leadership as they guide us. We should pray that our leaders are wise, discerning, and surrounded by helpful advisors as Christians. We believe that God has placed our leaders in authority over us. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, and we can ask him to use them as he wills. We should also pray for their protection. When praying for pastors or ministry leaders, we can ask God to give them strength in the midst of spiritual warfare and to remain encouraged in the Lord. We can also pray for their families who often feel scrutinized and bear an extra burden. Briefly, we should pray for our leaders to follow God's will, support those around them, and benefit their followers. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you to pray for our president. We ask that you grant him divine wisdom to lead this country with integrity. May he always serve and revere you in all his words and actions. We humbly request that you bless him with the grace to know how to unify our country and bring peace to all its people. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. We lift up the Vice President, Cabinet, and Advisors to the President. The Bible and history are full of examples of counsel to the King, resulting in laws and decisions leading the entire nation toward peace and prosperity, or toward division, destruction, and even collapse. Dear Prince of Peace, we humbly pray for the Senate and House of Representatives as they work on creating laws to govern our land and allocate our nation's resources. We ask you to grant them the wisdom to use our resources wisely and responsibly. Please guide and inspire our lawmakers to create laws that protect our families' freedoms and enabling us to live peaceful and happy lives.